about this D to G story. Can you tell us a little bit about that, why that's getting media pickup? Yeah, I think what we're seeing right now is that uh, obviously there's, you know, there's been this discussion about a strain where we see a, a mutation within the spike protein that is, uh, you know, it's basically a D to G uh, mutation. Uh, so basically a single amino acid has changed. Um, it changes, uh, we think the structure a little bit of the spike protein, but importantly, what's been seen is that um, by some researchers uh, in Florida, they actually looked at how basically this affected uh, essentially infectability uh, of the virus um, within cell culture. And I think that's kind of the big thing to keep in mind is that the work that's been done so far has been done in cells in a very isolated manner. Um, so in the laboratory, they saw that this mutation actually changed the ability of the virus to infect cells. Uh, and what they think is that this actually allows the virus to bind better to the ACE2 receptor on the host cell, which basically increases the ability for, uh, for the virus to infect epithelial cells. Um, the caveat with all of this is that it's what we call in vitro. So it's basically cell culture work and not in a whole animal. The issue with that is we, we've seen this before. So we saw this actually going back to the 2014 uh, West African Ebola epidemic, um, where there was basically mutations that were found within the glycoprotein of Ebola. And there was some discussion as to whether or not that actually changed um, essentially the transmissibility or the ability of the virus to infect cells. So in cell culture, yes, there was differences. When they looked back at human cases of disease and as well looked in animals, there was no difference. And I think that's you know, one of the things we have to keep in mind is what we see, even in complex cell culture systems, does not equate necessarily to what we see biologically. And I think, you know, I, I tweeted about the fact that, is it worrisome? Not yet. Um, is it interesting? Absolutely. It's something that I think we want to follow up on. We want to see if there's any validity to this. But the one thing we don't want to do is, I think, stoke fear about what this means. We're still at the point that ultimately we need people that are social distancing, using masks, and understanding that the virus is in the community. Those are the things that we need to focus on. Can I actually, on that note, and this is an open question to both of our guests today, um, we're hitting early July. What does if these kind of, obviously there's these questions about the virology in the distance, but what's the immediate term situation as far as what we now know about how the virus works? I mean, we're still debating asymptomatic transmission. <laughs> Dr. Kupali, I'll let you go ahead. Um, so I think that's a great question. I think that, you know, we know at this point that asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic transmission occurs. Um, I was just talking with uh, Dr. Kindercheck about this. There's a report that just came out today um, from CDC about a traveler who returned from China who had asymptomatic infection and is responsible for infecting um, over 71 individuals. So we do know that asymptomatic and symptomatic transmission mission are both important um, drivers of uh, COVID-19. Um, and that is why we continue to uh, highly recommend uh, the measures that we've been talking about for a long time. So um, maintaining physical distance, at least six feet apart, uh, wearing masks, um, or some sort of face cloth covering to help prevent your potentially infectious droplets from infecting other people. Um, maintaining good hand hygiene, um, and that's uh, you know, to prevent you from infecting yourself um, or also infecting the cloth face covering you're wearing. Um, using good respiratory etiquette um, at all times, even when you are wearing a cloth face covering. Um, these are all tried and true um, measures that together when used um, at all times are really going to help prevent transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19. And we need to continue to uh, be adamant about enforcing them and using them in our everyday life. That really is going to be the only way we uh, try to flatten the curve and turn this um, epidemic around.